Değerli izleyiciler, sevgili konuklar, özel bir röportajımıza hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Efendim hepimizin de şahit olduğu gibi iş dünyasında çok önemli değişimlerin, dönüşümlerin olduğu bir dönemden geçiyoruz. Böyle dönemlerde bildiğimiz oyunun kuralları değişiyor. Bizi bugüne getiren formüller bizi ileriye götürmemeye başlıyor. Ve böyle dönemlerde şirketlerin, yöneticilerin iyi olması hatta harika olmaları yetmiyor. Harika olmanın da ötesine geçmeleri gerekiyor. Peki bu nasıl olacak? Nasıl olacak da mükemmelin, harikanın da ötesine geçebileceğiz? Nasıl olacak da her şeyin bu kadar değiştiği, dönüştüğü bir dönemde bu kadar sosyal, ekonomik, çevresel faktörlerin iş dünyasının kurallarını dönüştürdüğü bir dönemde değer üretmeye devam edeceğiz. Nasıl olacak da bu değeri sadece kendi şirketimiz için, kendi birimimiz için değil bütün paydaşlar için paylaşılabilir hale getireceğiz. Ve liderler olarak nasıl olacak da yeni yetkinlikler, yeni beceriler elde ederek çok daha güçlü performanslar çok daha iyi kararlar alma ortaya koyma noktasında konumlanacağız ve kendimizi geliştireceğiz. Bunların hepsi çok geçerli sorular ama bir o kadar da cevabı kolay olmayan zor sorular. Neyse ki bugün çok değerli bir konuğum var. Kendisiyle birlikte bu sorulara cevap alacağız. Nicholas Lang, Nick diyoruz ona kısaca. Boston Consulting Group'un Global Advantage adı verilen biriminin yöneticisi ve aynı zamanda endüstriyel ürünler ve otomobil birimlerinin de çekirdek ekibinde yer alıyor. Sevgili Nick son 20 yıldır birçok gelişmekte olan ve gelişen ülkede e, globalleşmeden mobiliteye kadar birçok alanda çok değerli projelerde yer almış ve birçok büyük ölçekli şirkete danışmanlık hizmeti vermiş, strateji noktasında çok değerli katkılar yapmış. E, çok değerli bir uzman. Aynı zamanda bununla da kalmıyor. Sevgili Nick e, Beyond Great isimli kitabında eş yazarlarından bir tanesi. Bugün bizimle birlikte oluyor. Nicky, welcome. Great to have you today. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be in Istanbul and in Turkey. Uh, Nikki, let's start with the big picture. Uh, during the middle of the pandemic in 2020, you launched a book which I uh, read by underlining every sentence titled Beyond Great. And the book focused on the strategies for competing the new global reality. Mm -hmm. So you have been experiencing a shift in the global landscape and we have been experiencing a shift in the global landscape. And what about then? What is changing? What is the big picture uh, going through? Well, I think if you look at it, and one of the key drivers for us to write the book was that we see three major forces that are shaping the reality today. And three forces that are fundamentally changing the environment for businesses versus the 20, 30, 40 years before. And so these three forces, and it's also the subtitle of the book, is on one side what we call social tension, or the whole... I would say, environmental elements and society. Second, it's what we called growing nationalism. And I'll come to that in a second. And the third is what we see as a digital transformation, the digital transformation of businesses, of society at large. So let me go to each of them in, in step by step. Sure. Wh when we look at, at social tension, I think this is twofold. One is we see our environment under increased pressure. And if we look at climate change and the need for climate change, it is something where we need to really push forward if we do not want to leave a much worse planet to our children and our grandchildren. Uh, but at the same time, let's not forget that there is also social tensions coming up. Yeah? And if you look at social unrests like the Gilets Jaunes in France three years mm -hmm. ago, like Lives, Lives Matter movements, but also social unrest in South America and other places of the world, we see a, a tension in society, which I think also needs to be resolved. So take climate on one side and the societal inequity on the other, I think makes a very important, I think, call for action from a societal point of view. Then there's a second point, which is growing nationalism. And look, uh, growing nationalism is quite interesting to observe because after World War II, we were actually in a movement like for 50, 60 years, starting with the Conference of Bretton Woods, where the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade Organizations were put in place. Back then it was called GATT. But it was a world where actually free trade was the basic paradigm of the world. 
and you know over the years more and more countries joined this free trade logic um, and, and, and so the idea was that there was this statement saying the world is flat and when you look at what has happened over the last let's say 10 years well the suddenly mountains are rising on this world yeah uh, it is uh, tariff mountains tariff barriers that are coming up uh, if you look at the trade tension that took place uh, under the uh, Trump administration between China right. and US, this is one example of such barriers. By the way, these trade tensions are continuing also under the Biden administration. So it's nothing that is kind of fading away. If you look at Brexit, look, uh, it's a very clear example of where a free trade agreement and a free trade setup was politically challenged and changed. Um, but we also see, obviously, and we're now here in Istanbul, uh, just a few hundred kilometers away from Ukraine, we see massive geopolitical changes happening in Europe when we look at uh, the war in Ukraine and all the humanitarian, political and economic effects that this has on this continent. So I think this growing nationalism is a, is a very important force and, and, and where a lot of companies need to also think through what does this mean for their supply chains, what does this mean for their operations footprint and so on. And then there's a third dimension which is the digital transformation. Yeah? And I always keep saying like uh, the iPhone is as old as my daughter uh, uh, and my eldest daughter and it feels like just still a very short period of time. And, and uh, but it has changed so much, yeah? And I think uh, the pandemic had actually been a huge accel accelerator of digitalization because it forced each and every one to buy online, whether it's garments or foods or anything else. Um, and I think that digital transformation is moving forward. So take these three forces, social attention, economic nationalism, and digital transformation, and you find yourself as business leader in a completely new environment. Right, and also this environment seems to be an uncertain one, right? It is an, it is an, uncertain, uh, an uncertain environment with huge volatility, right. because uh, we don't know, well, of course, there are some plans in terms of how can we kind of reduce global warming, but uh, honestly said, it's not certain how these things will evolve. If you look at uh, geopolitical tensions and the volatility, just take now the huge volatility, I just give you two figures. The barrel of, uh, of oil went up to $129 uh, uh, during, the, uh, during the first days of the invasion. It's now down again to 100, it might go down again, but this volatility is huge. Right. If you take nickel, it used to be traded at $20,000 per ton, went up to $49,000 per ton. Uh, and again downward. So, so this volatility, this uncertainty is just amazing. Yeah. The three uh, drivers that you have already mentioned, Nikki, has been around for, for a decade, maybe yes. more, more than a decade. But in 2020, the pandemic hit. Yes. So lots of things have changed. Some of them accelerated, some of them decelerated, yeah. some of them get complicated maybe. Mm. So um, as we have been talking about going beyond great, why is it now more important to go beyond great? Well, I think um, the logic is that in this environment of society and of uncertainty and volatility, uh, a lot of traditional recipes to be great in business are being challenged. Yeah. So in the past, for example, I'll give you one very simple example, um, scale, size, getting cost down by building big factories was a very simple model. Yeah. So the idea was you set up a low cost factory that is serving the world. Now, take the pandemic, take trade barriers or take a war and suddenly your one mega factory serving the world is not the right solution because it might be in the wrong place. You might not get any logistic support to get your products out or you might find yourself in some kind of trade barriers. So you're finding much more this network of smaller factories that are spread around the world. So I think this is just for me an example where in the past it was great to have one large factory at the lowest cost possible place and to serve the world. While today my suggestion would be rather have a network of factories that might be much more agile and able to serve the world in a much more sustainable 
and resilient way. Right. The resilience seems to be the, uh, the gold card of the game. We have been writing a lot of articles about keeping the delicate balance between resiliency and agility. So I think this will be on the agenda of the leaders for, for a while. So uh, in the book, you are uh, describing nine strategies mm -hmm. to cope with all those challenges and to go beyond great. Can you elaborate a little bit on those nine strategies? Yes, so we developed nine strategies, uh, mainly around the theme um, of, of, of purpose, the theme of organization, and the theme of uh, people. Yeah, I think this is uh, very important. So when we look at the nine strategies, I think there are a few strategies which I find particularly interesting. Uh, and maybe let me go uh, and focus on three. Please. Um, there is uh, one strategy which we uh, call do good and grow beyond, which is about, I would say, the total societal impact that companies can have. And uh, if you remember what we just discussed before, social tension, nationalism, digital transformation, I think more and more companies have to find their place in society. And they realize that it's not only about shareholders, but it's about stakeholders. They need to think about how they fit in their community, yeah? how what they can really contribu contribute back to society. And so one example we have described in the book is a, is a, is a very famous um, uh, Brazilian company, cosmetics company called Natura, um, which owns also companies such as Body Shop and Avon, for example. And this company is, has a very clear purpose in terms of protecting the environment and in terms of developing uh, human beings and peoples. And so what I find very interesting is that they were not only uh, the first one who kind of really uh, developed fully organic cosmetic products, yeah, also to protect the forest in, in, in Brazil, but they were also people that when it came to selling the products actually empowered a lot of ladies to become their sales agents. They educated them in presentation skills, in accounting skills, sales and all these kind of things, <laughs> sales skills. And, and that's, that's, that's where I think the contribution to society uh, and the contribution to the community in which these companies act is quite important because it's protecting on one side the environment and on the other side it's empowering uh, a certain par portion of society to be successful uh, in entrepreneurs. Yeah. So I find this is a very interesting example. Um, so that's one strategy. Then there's another strategy when we come to operations, which I, is close to my heart, which is about ecosystems. Ecosystems is, I think, for me, the new art of, of corporate collaboration. Yeah? In the past, you were doing joint ventures, you were doing mergers and acquisition and things like this. I think we're moving towards an ecosystem uh, era. And, and here also, I think we have in the book a very good example about the large uh, car manufacturer um, who kind of moved from uh, <coughs> very traditional joint venture logic to uh, really setting up ecosystems to develop the new uh, digital car. Yeah, if you want to have a car that is connected, autonomous, uh, electric, um, software-based, you really need to move from this traditional, I'm working in one industry with always the same suppliers, to a network of partners. Yeah? And I find it very interesting because in this ecosystem where in the past you had always the same supplier, you were always in the automotive industry, you were regularly working in the same uh, country, <coughs> here you're suddenly facing 50 partners, mm -hmm. you are in six or seven industries, you are in 12 countries, and that management complexity is massive. But that's what is a typical way of saying what was great in the past is now beyond great and ecosystems are definitely beyond great. Right. And also the COVID uh, era is pushing or driving this ecosystem approach to a higher level, I guess, because we have been seeing a lot of need for collaboration. Even competition is becoming uh, one of yes. the norms. So I think the next decade will be the decade of ecosystems. Yeah, and just maybe on a side note, we did an, a very interesting analysis looking at Chinese digital ecosystems who helped during the COVID era. So when you look at the way how quickly China built hospitals in Wuhan, for example, or uh, how, uh, let's say, the big digital players in China 
have contributed to making sure that the pandemic is being managed, information flows and things like this. It's an ecosystem play. Right. Yeah. But let me add, add maybe the third st yes, strategy, please. which I find very interesting and which is actually what we call the always on transformation, th which, by the way, is a very important part um, uh, going forward. And, and we have a great example of Microsoft in, in this book as well. Uh, because it, um, Sadia Nadella has been, has been really one of the masters of putting on this always on transformation. And it's quite interesting because in the past people said like, okay, we do a transformation, then we're transformed, and then we stay on this for the next uh, 10 years, and then we might do another transformation. The reality is in, a, in such a flexible and fluent uh, environment in which we are, you have actually to make sure that you are always in this transformation mode, yeah? yeah. Uh, and, and you need to make sure that people understand in their heads what is the overall purpose, that they embrace it in their heart, and that they actually take their hands to really operationalize this change. Be it on a cultural point of view, be it on a process point of view, be it on a purpose point of view, I think these are all elements where you have this always on transformation. And I think Microsoft is a great example of, of having that. Right. And um, in the book, you have been going through some examples or some uh, case studies, if I may. And these nine strategies, uh, it's not very easy to uh, implement all of those nine strategies, but only a very few companies are able to uh, go the last mile or able to implement these strategies. So what really sets these companies up apart and uh, what can others learn from them, especially the companies that you have taken as case study in the book? Mm. So I think you're right. Huh? Uh, when you look at, we, we looked in total, we did an analysis of about 2,400 companies. And it's interesting that less than 1% uh, are actually beyond great on all nine strategies. Um, and, and what I think is interesting is that those companies that are great on all nine or on, on a large number of, 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 these are all companies that have actually a, a very, what we found a very, very visionary leader. So a very visionary CEO, but at the same time a, an empowered XCOM an, or executive committee or management board where actually um, there is a culture of, of, of collaboration, there's a culture of mutual support. And I think, um, so having on the top a visionary leader and then having an XCOM where you have a very collegial, collaborative way allows you to really excel both on the purpose level, on the transformation level, on the people level and on the operation level. Given your experience and engagement with leaders, Nikki, what advice would you give to Turkish companies looking to navigate this climate and establish long-term viability and growth? Um, look, I have, uh, yesterday by chance, I was asked how many times I've been in Turkey. So we, we came to close to 50 times. 50? 5-0, uh, wow. yes, 50 times in the last 20 years. So I, 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 I hope to know a little bit about uh, your beautiful country, but, but, um, uh, but yeah, I think uh, let's go through the one by one. Um, I think Turkish companies can contribute a lot uh, to uh, the whole, I would say, business development in Turkey and beyond the region by really embracing a very strong view of purpose in terms of saying what is it that we want to jointly achieve. Yeah, And I think the role of Turkish businesses in society at large is extremely important. Yeah, And I think uh, uh, you, whether it is uh, climate change, so decarbonization, I think is something which is uh, very important. Um, or whether it is also social engagement. I think this is all two elements where I think there is a big, big step to be done. Um, then when we look at the topic of, of nationalism and the environment, we just talked about it. I think Turkey and its businesses are located in a very important and also sensitive uh, region of the world. And of course, I think the trading links you have uh, to most of your neighboring countries are an important element of stabilization, which I think is also very important. 
Um, and the third thing which I find interesting is that Turkish companies are actually at the forefront of digitalization. I had the privilege to support some of the Turkish companies in their digitalization. And I think um, uh, wh whether it is in the automotive industry, in the banking industry, in other industries, we see a, a real strong push towards uh, digitalization, uh, both on the B2C and B2B area. And therefore, I think um, there is really a big potential going forward in those three areas. Nikki, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your insights. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much.